great. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody. And thank you for coming to AI and Deep Learning for Enterprise. Uh, we are a meetup dedicated to all things applied AI. We have a slightly different event this evening, thanks to a very generous sponsorship from Sam and Nova. Um, this is our first in a new series of events supplementing our usual monthly meetup, uh, all about focusing on particular areas of AI. This month, we are talking about development with AI, and we have lots of exciting talks on that topic. Uh, just a quick bit of housekeeping before I introduce Kinley, our first speaker this evening. Uh, so on the agenda, uh, we have Kunle, who's got an exciting announcement, talking about some very cool things Sam and Nova are doing. Uh, we have a demo from Anton, also from Sam and Nova, and we have a, a very cool uh, talk on how to build an open source LLM chat agent from John Sandel, who's just up at the back. A um, couple more things. Uh, we have a code of conduct for all our other events. Uh, long story short, we want to create a welcoming and inclusive environment where people can engage and learn and feel safe in the community. If you want to find out more about that, uh, you can scan the QR code and see the full version on our website. And without further ado, I will hand over to Kinley for our first talk. Okay. Thanks you for that uh, introduction. So uh, my name's Kunle Alokoten and I'm the uh, co-founder and chief technologist of Sam Bonova. Uh, so the talk that I was scheduled to give, I already, already gave uh, earlier this afternoon, uh, so how many people were at uh, AI and Data World and, and, and saw that? A few of you. Okay, so it, that's great because I didn't actually want to go through the whole thing again. And so uh, what I'm going to do is for those who weren't there, I'm going to hit the highlights and then I'm going to take some questions. Uh, how about that? Does that sound good? All right. So the exciting announcement is, is Samba 1 and we're... Ah. Ah, the slides are, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I will uh, speak without the slides before I get, uh, before they get them up. So, uh, so many of you, or well, how many people here have, have heard of Sam and Over? Now. Well, now, but, you know, before today. Okay, I'll, yeah, okay. well, Sam and Over's been, uh, you know, it was co-founded about uh, seven years ago, and uh, uh, the other co-founders are the CEO, Rodrigo Liang, and uh, Chris Ray. And uh, these are you know, uh, people who I've known for many years, and uh, you know, I, uh, the, the, I trust them, and uh, I'm in awe of their capabilities, and this is why uh, I'm uh, it, you know, working with them again. Uh, so it was founded uh, seven years ago with the goal of transforming the AI landscape and in particular focusing on what was required to provide enterprise grade AI, right? So this is, uh, uh, you know, goes beyond what you need for consumer facing AI, which of course is uh, the thing that has excited uh, the, the huge, uh, uh, excited everybody you know, uh, in terms of sort of what AI is capable of, but you know, if you wanna actually provide uh, AI capabilities in large enterprises, then you need more than, uh, you know, a chat GPT interface. And so, yeah, sure. Okay, so uh, Rodrigo on the uh, left there and Chris Ray on the right. And, you know, in order to uh, do a full stack uh, company that goes all the way from new AI chips, uh, new uh, system software, and new AI models, you need to fund the, the business appropriately. And so we, we raised a, a over a billion dollars from the uh, you know, investors uh, who are both sophisticated and, and committed and, uh, uh, and fully uh, you know, uh, backing uh, our success. So I'm going to skip directly to uh, Samba 1 and talk about some of the requirements that you need for a, uh, a enterprise uh, grade uh, uh, AI uh, capability. First of all, of course, you need to have the ability to have 
lots of accurate models that can be used for various uh, 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 tasks and scenarios, right? Uh, and so accuracy is important because, of course, you want to make sure that whatever task uh, you're using the AI for can be completed as successfully and, and uh, as uh, successfully as possible. But then you also need it to be broadly applicable, right? Because you've got lots of different tasks that you want to perform and you want to make sure that uh, your AI infrastructure uh, will work uh, just as, as well on, uh, you know, uh, text summarization as uh, it does on SQL generation or coding or, uh, or mathematical reasoning. Uh, third, you want it to be manageable, right? You want to be able to uh, you know, manage your models and your, your system from one simple user interface. Uh, and, and this is uh, key to being able to scale the whole uh, infrastructure and, and, uh, and not uh, you know, be overburdened by uh, you know, what you need to do to make uh, the, the uh, uh, software aspects of the, the system usable. Uh, security is, is really important, right? So modern data, sorry, modern enterprises are, are you know, digital enterprises, right? So they, they generate data and they use data and that data is very valuable. And so I would argue that, you know, if your data has no value, then your business has no value. And so if you've got valuable data, you're going to use this valuable data to train your models to do things that are specific to your enterprise. And then once you've trained those models, you want to be able to own those models and you want to make sure that you're not locked in to a particular, uh, you know, vendor's model in order uh, to continue to develop and, and use those models. So being secure, owning the model, and you know, one of the ways of ensuring that uh, you don't have vendor lock-in is to use open source and open models and open infrastructure uh, that isn't controlled uh, by any uh, one entity. And most importantly, you know, if you want to deploy uh, AI in an enterprise environment, and you want to scale it to enterprise uh, uh, levels of scalability, then you need it to be cost effective. You need to get the right sort of return on investment, and you need to make sure that you can uh, scale the infrastructure at a cost uh, effective and a predictable uh, manner. So these are the key uh, requirements that are all uh, provided by SAMBA 1. And so SAMBA 1 is a combination uh, of, of both new AI model, uh, model uh, architecture and new underlying infrastructure for uh, providing uh, the computational uh, environment to run this, the, the, these new models. And so it's, uh, you know, if you think ab about the way that it, uh, it's organized, the, the key new model architecture idea is called a, a uh, it's, called, it's called COE, which is a composition of experts, right? So you may have heard of other ways of, of, of uh, combining experts, but a composition of experts uh, is a way of, of, of bringing together multiple open source uh, uh, experts together in a unified and uh, way such that you can uh, have a uh, single entry point to the model, uh, but the model is in fact structured in a very modular way that uh, is composed uh, such that you can have, in this case, uh, over 1.3 trillion parameters uh, being served uh, in a way that is, is very cost effective and, 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 and uh, uh, highly capable. So the key uh, elements of the uh, Samba uh, COE model is that you know it has it has lots of parameters because of course that improves accuracy, but it's composed of 54 experts. So you can think about uh, the modular modular design of the the architecture. It says there's sort of one expert, and each of these experts, of course, have probably at least seven billion parameters, but some of them have many more parameters. Uh, 
and they're based on open source uh, models, and uh, they combine the ability to uh, do uh, uh, to, 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 to model multiple domains, multiple languages, and of course can be applied to a variety of different tasks. So one of the key elements that you want, as I said, that, that is really important that you want is you want accuracy. You want high levels of accuracy. And one of the questions that people uh, often ask is, well, you know, one of the alternatives that uh, uh, to, to, uh, to, or in fact, the, the dominant way of, of, uh, of using generative AI today is the monolithic model that is uh, provided in the cloud. You know, you can get this from OpenAI or Anthropic uh, and or, 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 or Gemini. And so uh, the question then is sort of th this uh, idea of composition of experts, how accurate is it? And for our purposes, the focus is how accurate is it on uh, tasks that uh, you might uh, uh, perform at the, at the enterprise, right? So uh, the uh, enterprise-grade AI benchmark uh, is a set of uh, enterprise-specific uh, uh, tasks, you know, ranging from information extraction to uh, SQL generation, uh, math uh, and uh, reasoning, uh, text editing, and what you see is if you compare the uh, accuracy uh, to uh, GPT 3.5 uh, in the light green and GPT 4 in the dark green, what you see is that uh, the uh, Samba 1 uh, COE model is, uh, you know, comparable or better uh, to these, uh, you know, uh, monolithic uh, models which are, are, are served in the cloud. So, so the key elements of Samba 1, as I said, is this new idea of composition of experts as a way of structuring your model such that it is, has a lot of the benefits uh, that, that I mentioned, that, that you know, it's modular, it's easier to, uh, uh, to, to secure, it's easier to uh, provide access, right? So for instance, you may not want uh, your uh, a marketing department to uh, use the same model as the, uh, the product development or engineering department. Uh, you might, might, the finance will, will, might, will, might want their own set of models, and it's very difficult to provide this level of uh, access if you have one large monolithic model. However, if each of the departments gets their own model, then their model can be customized and specialized so it is actually more accurate and more appropriate for the tasks they want to perform. And you know, from a security and privacy uh, and access point of view, it's much easier to control because you can control uh, what uh, models uh, certain uh, users get access to. So Composition of Experts provides all of these capabilities. And so then the question is sort of, how do you make it uh, efficient to actually provide uh, the, the infrastructure, I mean, how do you provide the, the infrastructure that, that efficiently serves a composition of experts model? Well, the key element is the SN40L AI chip. So let me briefly talk about that. Uh, you know, you need a router, and we could go into details about how you provide a router, but we will skip to the chip, and the chip is, uh, very high-end chip that has lots of transistors, lots of, of, of cores, and lots of teraflops. But what is really distinctive about this chip is really the, the right side, uh, the three-tier data flow memory. So the key, one of the key computational ideas behind the chip is an idea called data flow, but I don't have time to go into this. Uh, but uh, let me just focus on this three-tier uh, data flow memory, which is comp composed of on-chip memory, uh, high bandwidth memory, and high capacity memory. And uh, what you see is lots of bandwidth between the different levels. Uh, but the level which is unique and distinguishes the uh, uh, SN40L from, from GPUs is this very high capacity, high bandwidth memory. So uh, imagine you've got four of the chips, sorry, eight of the chips together in a system, then this is the uh, 
uh, characteristics of the system that you will see. And the key thing that uh, this high capacity memory provides is the ability to store up to five trillion parameters, which is bigger than, than any model that you typically see uh, uh, today, monolithic or otherwise. Uh, and, and, the, and the thing that makes it possible to serve this model efficiently uh, is the ability to transfer the model parameters from the high capacity DDR to the HBM. And so if you're thinking about sort of how you structure your models and how you deploy them at scale, uh, traditionally what happens is, you know, due to the limited amount of memory that, that GPUs have, uh, what has to happen is that, and typically the, the way things are structured is, you might have one model, uh, you know, if you were trying, if you, if you imagine that you had models which were, which were small enough, then you probably would have one model per system, or you would have, you know, one much larger model spread across multiple systems. However, with the high capacity memory that the uh, San Bonova SN40 uh, L provides, we can fit this model, uh, could be, uh, especially a COE model, uh, all into the high capacity memory. And then the way that the, the, the model uh, gets executed is that, this is the part I skipped, is that the prompt comes in and then you have to decide which expert should, uh, you know, uh, serve the prompt, right? So if it's a question about su text summarization, summarization, then you kind of send it to the uh, model that, 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 that is, uh, uh, knows about that. If it's a model about mathematical reasoning, then you send it to uh, the math uh, uh, optimized uh, specialized model. And so uh, there is, in fact, another model that does this routing, or since we're in, in England, uh, routing, right? <laughs> and so uh, the, this model, in fact, is, is, is both, uh, you know, you set it up to be the router, and then it, it, over time it can be improved and, and will learn to, to route uh, the, the prompts uh, better and, and, uh, and uh, get uh, higher accuracy. But so once you decide that you're going to run a particular expert, you can't run the expert from the high capacity memory. You've got to run the expert from the high bandwidth memory. So you've got to move the expert uh, parameters from the uh, high capacity memory to the uh, uh, high bandwidth memory, and uh, that takes time, right? And so uh, if you look at, at uh, how much time that takes, it's dramatically less on a SN40L compared to a uh, NVIDIA uh, DGX A100 uh, or a DGX H100. And so the impact of doing that is that if you look at the time it takes to, uh, uh, so, uh, to provide um, 20 tokens in this example, to generate tw 20 tokens, uh, what happens is, is the time is, uh, is constant uh, up to uh, 407 billion token experts on the, uh, on the RDU system. However, uh, at a certain point, uh, uh, typically about, about 40 experts on the uh, GPU systems, uh, you start incurring much higher latency because of the cost of switching between the experts. And so the, the whole point here is that not only do you get high accuracy with COE, if you run COE on a uh, RDU system such as the uh, 40 SN40L, what you'll also get is scalable, cost-effective uh, cost serving of that model. And so uh, you know, the last point that I said was very important about how do you provide a system that uh, uh, is, uh, provides predictable, cost-effective uh, uh, enterprise uh, inference, uh, then you need this kind of capability uh, provided by the uh, SN40L. 
So uh, lastly, uh, I want to talk about a couple of other things that we have in the Samba One ecosystem. Uh, I think uh, you're going to talk about uh, Sambaverse? OK, so let me just briefly int introduce Sambaverse, right? So as a developer, uh, you might want to uh, figure out uh, you know, what model, what open source model actually uh, is the best, uh, most suitable for the, the task that you have at hand, right? So the problem with that is that you could go to Hugging Face and, and get the model, but you wouldn't be able to uh, easily uh, you know, get an endpoint that would actually serve that model, right? And, and then particularly even if you could try the most popular models, maybe there's a model that, uh, uh, that, that, that uh, is less popular and you want to be able to compare multiple models on your task. Well, Sambaverse is your solution here. So you, know, you can provide prompts and you can compare up to six different uh, models at the same time you know, in real time so that you could do head-to-head -head comparisons and decide which model that you'd like to use for your application. So that's Sambaverse, and uh, I'll let uh, Anton uh, demonstrate for you, and I think uh, all the people I know who've tried it think that this is really uh, incredibly useful uh, for uh, developing AI applications, and it's going to be a, a key component of what uh, uh, developers want to do in an enterprise environment. So I think at this point, I will uh, you know, stop and ask if there are any questions. Okay. Uh, oh, you question, yeah. Sure. So you spoke a lot about the possibility of writing code. How does that compare to the Yeah, it's a very, very good question. So it, it really is, is a, a, a matter of the granularity at which you are mixing, right? So in fact, a mixture of experts is really a, a just this, a different way of designing a monolithic architecture, right? So it turns out if you look at the way that, that these models uh, work, then you've got multiple layers of multiple components in your model. And uh, in a mixture of experts, uh, you, you have different parts of, of, of the layer that get activated depending on what sort of prompt comes in. Uh, so the thing that's different uh, uh, in, in a uh, composition of experts is that in a composition of experts, each of the uh, experts is completely independent, right? And so it could be fine-tuned uh, independently, uh, it could be specialized independently, it could be controlled, the access to, to it could be uh, controlled independently, which is not true of mixture of, ex of experts. Uh, so, there, you know, in, in uh, computer science and mathematics, there's this idea of sparsity, right? Where, which means that, you know, you're only looking at, you know, if you're looking at, uh, at some, some data structure, uh, you're only accessing parts of it instead of, the whole of it, right? And so in both mixture of experts and composition of experts, there is this notion of sparsity, but in a mixture of experts, it is a very fine-grained form of sparsity. And in fact, you are really just, you know, talking about a single monolithic model, whereas in composition of experts, the sparsity is much coarser in the sense that Whenever a prompt comes in, you only fire up uh, one model uh, once, you, you, maybe two of you think about the router as a model, and then the particular expert that is going to uh, generate the tokens in response to the prompt. Yeah. Well, well, it's an enterprise-ready chip, right? Designed by uh, designers who have been designing enterprise hardware for the last 20 years, right? At, at companies like uh, Sun Microsystems, uh, Intel, Oracle, 
right? And so if you look up the, the system, it, it, is, it is, has all the, the kinds of fault tolerance uh, capabilities and is being rigorously tested uh, to be able to perform uh, you know, reliably and robustly in an enterprise environment. And in fact, it has uh, you know, a lot of sort of control mechanisms that, that, that make it possible to, to achieve very high performance. Uh, you know, if you know uh, anything about computation these days, you'll know that it's really power or energy limited, right? So you can, you can put more resources on a chip than you can afford to power, right? And so depending on how, what computation you're doing, uh, you may need to throttle your design to live within a, a certain power envelope. And so one of the ways of doing it is to, to, is to do a worst case design. But then that means you're going to be over, oh, you're not going to get the performance uh, uh, on a lot of uh, different uh, sorts of, of applications. But if you've got dynamic mechanisms that only throttle dynamically when, when necessary, then you overall you're going to get much more performance. So there are a lot of these sorts of automatic uh, control mechanisms built in uh, that, that allow you to extract the most uh, performance out of, out of a watt of power uh, that, that, that comes uh, out of the wall. So very robust, yeah. So th the question is, you know, ma make it easy for, uh, for, for developers to uh, d you know, develop new, new models? Compatible with, so you know, the, the models uh, that, that we uh, start with you know, come from the open source, right? So uh, if, if the models have been developed using uh, the base Foundation models that, that you know, like Llama or or, um, uh, or any of the other other models, uh, Mosaic, uh, uh, Mixtel, Mistral, and so on. Uh, then you know th there should not be a, any uh, issue in, in, in porting them to Samba Nova. Uh, you know, in terms of, sort of optimizing uh, for for, for Samba Nova, uh, you know, Samba. Uh, uh, What's the environment that's used? The, um, Samba. The, for, for, for developing, for, for fine tuning models. Oh, Samba Studio. Sam, Samba Studio. Samba Studio enables you to do, do this sort of fine tuning uh, to optimize for uh, the uh, Samba uh, environment and, and, and the different uh, uh, architectures that we provide. <laughs> Yeah. So is that to say that the Samba code is still fully that we have it's massively robust and Samba is not that new stuff? Yeah, in fact you can go you can go to Hugging Face, so right? But you then are able to interfere to accelerate the compute power of the chip? Yeah, they can be I mean there's a, there's a, there's some compiler work that goes into yeah. taking those models and, 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 and mapping them to the chip so that they work uh, yeah. as efficiently as possible. Yeah. Okay, time for me to turn it over to Anton. Ah, your cold mic. Ah, there we go. Two mics. Thank you. Oh yeah, so do we prevented uh, the the hands. Yes, if I can squeeze my nose in. Push this. Thank you. Are you okay? Are you giving it to you? Are you okay? Yeah, sure. Does it work? Yeah. Can people hear me okay without the? I need I need two hands otherwise. <laughs> it could be very slow. Okay, so um, let me just do this. And everybody's able to access this now. So what I want to show is this new thing. It's very exciting called Sambaverse. Everybody right now you can try this Sambaverse.sambanova.net. Um, and as Kunle was describing, and Kunle, Kunle, Kunle uh, um, undersells himself, 
Finlay is a, um, a highly revered professor at Stanford University that invented multi-core processing. So uh, our other co-founders, Chris Ray, who's a MacArthur Genius Award winner and one of the premier authorities on AI in the world, and Rodrigo, our CEO, who's, who's one, of the, one of the best technology executives there is in Silicon Valley. These people are, are very good and very smart. Uh, and this SN40L chip isn't just another chip. It really is incredibly powerful. And the, the, but the thing I think, candidly, that we've struggled with as a company is when Kunle asked the question at the start, do you know who Samanova is? Like everybody should know who Samanova is because what we do is very impressive. Uh, we, we, we've somewhat struggled to reach the developer community because you've got these big systems and these big systems are very expensive and if you want to buy one, talk to Richard. But, you know, but in, in, terms of, in terms of their, their accessibility to the community, that, that, that's something we've never really had before. And Composition of experts and SN40L has allowed us to really give something back to the community, which is very, very, very important for, for the community, but for us, because we want mindshare, we want people to know who we are. Um, and, and that's why we've created this thing called Sambaverse. And the reason we think Sambaverse is, is, is good and offers a lot of value is for those of you, and I, I, I would assume many of you know this because you, you do this, this is, your, uh, this, this is how you spend your day. Relying, so making the assumption that these expert models are, are very good at, um, at, at, at specific tasks and the collection of these expert models are, are, are really, really good at abstract uh, sort of multitask problems. Um, how do you find the right experts for every single problem that you have? And, and as many of you know, they're, they're, whenever you're trying to solve a problem, it's not one task, it's a collection of tasks. So, so it becomes combinatorially difficult. Uh, so, what, so relying on the quantitative benchmarks, of which there are many now, is not very good and I think the, collectively the community would agree that the quantitative benchmarks do not represent quality. Uh, and so what other mechanisms do you have to be able to assess quality whenever you have tens of thousands of derivative models from Mistral and, uh, and, and, and Lama and now Gemma and all of these new things. Even when Gemma came out, people are tr still trying to work out how good Gemma is. Like it, in, in some cases it's very strong quantitatively, in some cases it's not that strong quantitatively. Until there is an explosion of fine-tuned derivative models from Gemma, only then can you actually match it against Mistral and Lama, and, and, and people actually have this understanding. So there really is a gap for really good qualitative evaluation. And because of our systems advantage, because we, we can run huge, huge numbers of, um, of, of these expert models on, for instance, a single node, uh, we're able to do this. We're able to do this very cost-effectively in such a way that you can't on GPUs, and thus we're able to do it in a way that we can offer it to the community um, uh, for free. So that's, that's, the, that's all of the prelude, right? So Samba, Sambaverse, wh what it enables you to do is compare models and have them process concurrently. And it's via UI, but you also have an API available. So for instance, um, uh, let, let me see, I have, I have quite an elaborate, let me. Let me, let me go here. I have this really elaborate uh, uh, code prompt that I'm going to try. And, and to begin with, I'm just going to try one single model, which is Deep Sea Coder, and, even, and, and demonstrate that even independent of like, comparing other models, comparing a single model with, um, with different system prompts, or one without a system prompt, for instance, and one with a system prompt, uh, kind of incredible, incredible effects. Let me see if we can get the link. Thanks. Oh goodness. So okay, so um, I'm going to do that, and I'm going to put the same model in here. I'm going to use this prompt. Uh, so I'm going to write a Python program that takes an integer input n and plots all prime numbers less than n on a graph, where the x-axis represents the prime numbers and the y-axis represents the values. Make sure to label the axis appro appropriately. So 
if you see how these are going to process, they're going and 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 th we're launching this today, so there's there's a lot of usage going on. Um, so without the system prompt, it does a it does a pretty terrible job. It's not even really for some reason representing it as uh, as as a code block. Um, uh, whether as with the system pro and it, and it's it's inserting like it's inserting descriptions in between, which is incredibly <laughs> just not useful because I want to copy and paste my code into my IDE. So, um, so yes, so you can see here that it's telling you it's it, it, it's explaining what the functions are, but the actual code blocks just one code block. So I can just copy and paste this into my into my IDE. And so, so in this case, I've just shown an example of, uh, I've done some steering here. I've sort of tried to explain that, that, that you, you're a coding expert and so be good at coding. But I've also, I've, I've, um, I've aligned the structure to the model. I've, I've asked it to uh, structure it as instruction, prompt, response. And that allows me to generate a, a single code block. So this is interesting. And I wouldn't know that unless I was able to do this concurrently or, I mean, it would have been much more difficult for me to do it uh, uh, um, not using some of So, right, let me now try. We also, as part of this launch, we, we do a lot of our own training in-house because we make systems, so we have, lots of, we have lots of compute that others don't, which is nice. So we get to train lots of models. And um, we, w we've, we've done a lot of work with customers recently on uh, especially low resource language ad adaptation. Um, which is which is really beneficial because these models are really good in English and they're really good at like high resource languages or they they don't do as well in like Bulgarian which is obviously more much much more niche there's not as much training data available and we released a paper recently on this on how we do it and and it's very interesting and we open sourced all of these what we call Sambalingo models so I mean we're able to just uh, take lots of these models and we have chat versions. We also actually have uh, just base versions as well for those who are trying to build maybe um, an, an instruct model on top. And you can do this via the API, which we make, which we mean you don't need it. Uh, oh yes, let me just show that. That's 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 a good thing to show. Uh, so you're able to interact with this via an API, which means you can actually do lots of more, lots more than six concurrently, if you want to, um, uh, and and use Semiverse that way. The UI is obviously just more better for, for demos. And let me do a few more. I don't know if anybody speaks any of these languages here, so you can't really, you don't know if I'm blind or not, but I'll take my word for it. Okay, there you go, right, that's probably right. Um, So these are all English, uh, uh, both both English and that language. Uh, so um, uh, <laughs> you can see, interestingly, these have all been trained differently uh, because they've been trained on different corpuses. So some of them just do do crazy things because they haven't been system prompted properly. Uh, I mean, that one has, but you wouldn't have known that unless you were able to to uh, to prompt them all together. So. Oh, you're still going. Let me stop this one. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. Like it didn't happen. Um, and then uh, let me let me show another cool example. Uh, let me do. So Mistral, Mistral is obviously a a really really good model. Um, and loads of people have created these derivatives. Um, such as the Zephyr model from Hugging Face, which is an aligned model, uh, like built on Mistral base, but but aligned. And then um, Snorkel also released a model recently, which is um, not aligned using RLHF. It's aligned using DPO. So interesting, interesting to see how a DPO model performs. The, the same base model performs against an RLHF model. Um, so like we can ask it, uh, let's see, 
Um, and so I want to see w what, or, or just prompt these models to ask what can each of them do. Um, and you'll see here, uh, yeah, you, you, you can see here immediately the, the verbosity, the difference in the verbosity in the structure. Uh, all, all Mistral models all just align differently for chat purposes or, or instruct purposes, and they just behave incredibly differently. So, I mean, I think this, this demonstrates quantitative benchmarks. It's very hard to represent that. It's very hard because especially, especially for chat, everything is so dependent on the preferences of the person that it's interacting with. And, and, and it's, it's how to represent that quantitatively is very, very difficult. So, so um, we think this is lots and lots of utility. I think it's very exciting. We're, we're very happy that we're able to contribute this to the community and we hope that everybody uses it and this is, and, and, and we're able to find the best open source models there are instead of waiting on them to be upvoted and hugging face without anybody actually having interacted with them in any real way. Uh, so yes, very, very exciting. Um, and samanova.net. Please, please don't forget, .NET. It'll work with .AI soon, but we need to do some redirecting. Okay. Are we good for questions or doing questions? Yeah. We can do questions. I'll open this up again. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, you create you create an account. It's very very easy. If I was to log out, oh sorry. Um, if I was to log out, uh, you you log in again. You'll be able to go to the playground, but whenever you actually try to prompt, blah 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 blah, you'll be asked to log in. Um, super simple sign up process. Just email verification. Uh, in terms of rate limiting, yeah, because otherwise DDoS and all these types of things. Free service. Just kind of like building on that question, how do you run what kind of power of the thing that's going into it? Is it just the loading of like local cost rules request, or is that required to run the chat? No, 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 it's per user. Because we can load any number of, n number of uh, uh, instances of the same model because they're all running on the same system. Yeah, so we, we actually do it by, um, by, by eight socket systems because they can, uh, they can share memory across a node. So the, the DRAM that Kernley was talking about, that's sort of this, you can think of it as a, it, it isn't technically, but we can represent it as just this fungible shared memory store um, and so per eight sockets like in theory you can store up to five trillion parameters and you can slice and dice that if the, I mean para parameters equals roughly two bits right the parameters two bits so like you know it it, it all adds up to to 12 terabytes in theory uh, in, in theory that we can store on a node Thank you. Um, hands up if you um, are non-technical but love AI. I'm hoping that's everyone else who didn't just put their hands up. Cool, so um, mix of technical and non-technical in the room. Again, lots of Python code coming at you, but I will walk you through and maybe you will really um, learn and be able to use that intelligence to have better conversations with the technical people in your life. So uh, a little bit about myself, um, there is um, all of the code that I'm gonna be showing today, it is open source, you can find it online, I'll show you a, a link in a moment. Um, I run a data consultancy called Coefficient. So we, uh, we the sort of things that we're, we're talking about today, we do that for private sector, but mostly public sector clients. So talking about sort of enterprise, like government departments are a hell of an enterprise to try and build some of this technology for, that's our bread and butter. Um, but we also do lots of training, uh, we've got a course on edX about machine learning, targeted at finance, so check us out. 
Um, if you would like to get the, the, the code and the slides, um, then check out the chat efficient repo on GitHub. This is a QR code, an AI generated QR code. I really like these. Um, they're really living up to uh, the theme of tonight. Uh, so yeah, if you, if you take a photo of that, that should be functional. I did test it, it just about works somehow. So a bit of an overview. We're gonna start off with how do we build a chat model uh, using the, the key components. We're gonna start with OpenAI, see how that works. We're gonna use in Python. Then we're gonna move to LangChain because what we really want to do is build a private uh, LLM agent chatbot uh, that can run locally on your laptop uh, or on your device or within your organization's uh, 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 basically firewalled uh, uh, infrastructure. We're also then gonna talk a little bit about vector stores. Uh, what is RAG? We're talking a lot about RAG earlier. Let's go a little bit more into how RAG works at a, at a very practical level. Uh, we'll see more about that. And then uh, if we have time, we may cover some of the stream deck, which is mostly just how I'm putting all of these lovely building blocks together into a gorgeous UI with minimal code. So, on to the practical part. So this, uh, this is Jupyter Notebook uh, environment. Uh, this is uh, sort of a nice interactive coding environment, very similar to what you've just been seeing. Uh, so I'm gonna load in some of the libraries uh, that we're gonna be working with, the key one being this one here, OpenAI. I've also got a, a very handy single function I wrote for myself, uh, which is called scrape page. You give it a URL and it just gives you back the clean scraped data. And you'll see where that comes in later. So how do we actually uh, do this in Python? For those of you that have never built your own chatbot yet in a Jupyter Notebook, it's super easy, load up a client, load up API client. I'm gonna use GPT 3.5 Turbo, which I'm gonna look at for later. And you have to start thinking about tracking for the, the, for the, for the model, for the client, uh, what it knows. So this is sort of what we have to start doing. The model isn't that intelligent, you have to track this stuff for it in Python. And that's more about giving us as developers a lot of flexibility about what the model does or doesn't know. So we start it with a single, uh, single little message that says, right, system prompt, we saw it earlier, but in a uh, nicer UI, and you are a helpful assistant is the system prompt. Now I'm going to ask it a question. I've called it prompt, but this is just going in as a user uh, prompt. So now what does it know? It knows the two things, system prompt, user prompt, uh, with that being the question. And at this point, we run some code. We're gonna get a chat completion. We basically throw it all of the messages it's seen so far, so it's, it's like a goldfish. It doesn't know anything. We tell it what it knows. And we're gonna then extract the response from the completions and have a look. So there we go. Um, this is how GPT works using Limerice. Thank you very much, GPT 3.5 Turbo. And let's now add that response to the context. So we have to now tell it what it knows. You are the assistant. You now know this thing that you just told me. And this is where things get quite um, confusing as, as an AI developer, having to remember and start managing all of its memory and what it knows and what it doesn't know. So we can now play around with this and we can start having a conversation with it, building up that chat uh, message history. So it now knows all of the following things and we're just adding stuff on. So now do it as a haiku. Get the completion, rinse and repeat this code. It's the same as what you've just seen, but now we have haiku formed GPT information. And you have to start again. Remember, add that response to the context so it remembers what it just told you. Otherwise, it won't know that. So if you are developing with all of this stuff, it is worth knowing about caching, especially as a developer. Um, you're gonna start racking up some serious bills if you are uh, running this stuff over and over and over again because you might be doing that, especially in CI, for those of you who do like sort of unit testing. Uh, you probably don't want to have stuff rooting out over the internet as well. So very, very handy little Python tip. It's called joblib, it's called a joblib cache, and it's a simple thing, but uh, this function is just sleep three seconds and then calculates x by 10. So 666 goes in and that times 10 is gonna come out, but it's gonna be kind of slow. It just pauses for three seconds before telling us the answer. Now with this joblib thing, uh, we set it up two lines of code, we decorate our function, which again, those of you um, sort of newest to Python, it's just adding an at uh, a little bit like tagging someone on Twitter, but you do at cache, and that's it, that's what you need to do. This time, now it's cached, uh, it's gonna run it the slow time, but now it's seen this thing before, and it's immediately, it'll just say, I know the answer to this one. I've seen it, I've memorized it, or in computing we call it memoized, because the R gets dropped somewhere. Uh, we've memoized that, and I know the answer. So again, 42, first time it's seen it, it's gonna take three seconds. Comes back to us, the second time, it's seen it before, 
This is very useful if you're building web scrapers. You don't have to scrape the same page more than once ever. If you're building and uh, testing your infrastructure, again, just being able to do this kind of thing, thinking about memoization, it's just one of those sort of uh, performance tuning 101, but it really helps us when what we want to do is start taking all of the things you've just seen, such as, right, here's your, po here's your context. Here is the new prompt. I want to get a chat to completion, get the response, extract the response, and then add that response as well to the context. That's what this function does. It's the lines of code you've just seen uh, with our little at memory.cache on top. So it simplifies how I can start using this entire thing. We kick it off with a system prompt. This time it's, uh, it's gonna be my sales assistant. Thank you very much, sales assistant turbo. And we're gonna give it a little bit more of a prompt. This is uh, some information about gov.uk and uh, it's going to generate the response. I'm gonna have a look at it. And uh, actually in this case, the sales assistant is selling the UK government. Uh, usually it goes the other way around with coefficients, but uh, it's gonna try and sell the government to us. So we can say, you know what? That's not hitting the mark. Let's try again. Now, because it remembered its full context, that's what I've just done here. I've added in the context part of that function. It adds in the, 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 the inputs and the outputs. It's now remembering the whole conversation. So when I just say, can you make it sound more fun? It's the classic tricky thing. If you're not managing your conversation history, this is just gonna get confused what it means by it. But this little function is doing that. It's managing my history for me. And now it will just be able to update a better answer with a little bit more fun and panache. So that is the basics of building a very, very simple chatbot using the OpenAI Python library. Let's now talk about Langchain. So Langchain allows you to a little bit uh, like what we've been seeing earlier today. It allows you to rip in all sorts of other different models. You don't have to go with OpenAI. Uh, you could go with a locally running model. You could go with any of the other, you know, Claude 3 and so on. So the nice thing about Langchain, why Langchain? Because they all have their own different libraries, but those different libraries work in different ways. You've just seen with OpenAI, you have to learn the slightly arcane syntax this whole uh, client.chat.completions.create and in the different libraries, that'll all be different. And it's kind of annoying, if you want to just start switching between different LLMs, having to, uh, to remember all the different Python syntax, all the different LLM libraries is just a bit annoying. Langchain is one single, what we call API, basically the programming interface for us, the programmers, uh, one single way of doing it and switching from one LLM to another, even from an open AI to a locally running uh, Llama 2, is really simple. We just say, you know what, actually just use this different LLM, but the rest of your code stays the same. What does this mean? It means insane developer productivity um, because we get to move faster and maybe break things. So some of this is gonna look kind of similar. Uh, I'm gonna replicate the last example, but we're gonna use Langchain now to do it. So we're using Langchain OpenAI. Uh, we load in a little uh, LLM model, again, the same model as before, uh, Turbo Instruct. Uh, a little bit of uh, funk on the temperature and I'm doing some fun things now. I'm actually going to uh, start doing some chaining. That's kind of what Langchain is all about. So I'm actually going to get it to generate a random food, generate a random uh, color, put it all together, and make a, uh, a recipe for this cocktail. Fun warning about Langchain. I swear, every time you run this, something is going to break uh, since the last time you ran it. Langchain's API itself is moving quite fast. Now in Python, we can do things like pinning our defenses, but just word of warning, it's a bit of a, a turbulent environment to develop in at the moment, and that's probably the biggest negative that most people will say, Langchain just keeps on breaking every time you upgrade it. Something will have changed, and this is exactly what they mean. It still works, but hey, like we're gonna get rid of this whole function at some point, um, which again is easy to solve. You just throw that entire warning into ChatGPT and tell you how to fix it. So in this case, uh, it's decided to come with uh, purple cocktails featuring saffron and quinoa, and uh, the name that it's come up for, we, we're gonna feed all of that back into another LLM prompt, and it's calling it the Purple Saffron Quinoa Twist Mocktail, AKA Purple Haze, and it's, it's written all of this out for me. So thank you for uh, your wild ideas of uh, what we can do when we get to uh, the pub later, I guess. You can ask for one of those in this again. So how do we actually start building ch chat chains? Langchain is designed to make it easier. If this whole function that I wrote over here seems like a little bit of a faff, managing the inputs, the outputs, the responses, managing the, the, the LLM's own chat history, it is a faff, it shouldn't be that hard. It should be a little bit easier. So Langchain brings in a lot of stuff that makes some of these tasks easier. So one of them being the prompt template, it allows you to easily just start inserting things into your prompts down the line. So this is a fun template, it's basically uh, a long prompt that tries to turn our, our chatbot into a 20 questions mind reading game. 
So w notice this bit. This is where all the history is going to get injected. So every time uh, the, uh, the, the, the LLM that we use is going to get this template with the history, which is going to expand over time, but it still gets the full template because that's its memory. This, this one big string is its entire memory. It's not keeping track of that itself. We're keeping track of it for it in this template. And then every time it gets that history, it's also going to get one more thing, which is the prompt we just gave it, human input. And then it's going to get um, prompted here for, OK, this is your turn. Your bit is this bit here. So with that in mind, we can now set up a lang chain code, the prompt template. Uh, we're going to say, OK, override history with whatever the history is later when I give it to you. Override human input with a template when it comes later. But again, it's just setting things up there, placeholders to be replaced down the line. And that's it. We've got our prompt thing ready to go. That's one key piece of infrastructure. We also are going to say, actually, I want you to just handle all of the memory, all of that conversation, uh, the conversation buffer window memory. They're really good at naming things. Um, what this means is remember the last five things that we talked about. So if you want it to be full on goldfish mode or full on uh, genius mode, remember everything, you can just dial that up or dial that down, uh, depending on your application. And now let's put it all together. We're going to import the LLM chain, as in a chain of messages that's going to converse with an LLM. We're going to tell it which LLM to use. But again, if we wanted to use a different LLM, like Llama 2 or Vicuna, then we would literally just switch out this one tiny bit here, but the rest of our code from here on in is identical, no matter which LLM we're talking to. So the moment someone releases something new, like Gemma comes out on open source or whatever happens next, then we could use that too. The prompt goes in, and I'm going to say, you've got use your short memory thing that I've configured over here. So let's have some fun. Let's just do a chain. And I don't have to remember or tell it what to remember. It's all pre-configured at this point. So uh, let's play the game. I'm thinking of an animal. And it's got some nice formatting. And here's the chain. And uh, it's getting a little bit excited. It starts having a conversation with itself. So here's something to watch out for. You have to tell it. If it hits one of these, this, uh, you, you should stop here. Don't just start having conversations with yourself. And there is a configuration setting for it, which I have intentionally not set, which is the stop. Um, the, there's, a, there's a stop point. So you can have a, a list of things, uh, such as new lines are commonly used as, as these stops. Um, and you'll see me bring that in later. But for now, it's just had a whole conversation pretending to meet me and the assistant. And that's another thing that can be a bit tricky if you're trying to do this for the first time, uh, where you, you might say to an LLM, right, I want to have a conversation with you. You pretend to be... Uh, I don't know, one of, our, one of our target audience, and I'm going to use you for practicing my sales uh, patter. And, and then it will just say, ah, oh, let me sell some stuff to you. It gets confused about who it is, and this is probably why. So just keep a close eye on, on this thing. But let's just say, no, nope, this is not a mammal. Um, ask another question. And, uh, and it's going to start continuing to have this conversation. And we can see the conversation here uh, as well in full. So maybe it's going to try and guess, um, is it a bird? Uh, and we can say, uh, OK, yeah, let's, let's keep on asking questions. It is a bird. Um, what's it asking next? Slightly wildly long chain. OK, and it keeps on having conversations with itself. And it's thinking, oh, yes, it must be a parrot. OK, it's, it, it is a parrot, but don't be mean. So that's, that's, that's where we might end up here. But it's kind of frustrating that it's doing, doing this for us, although it does like to name things, as you can see. So that's all well and good, but it's still GPT. It's still garden variety commercial LLMs. Let's do something cool. Let's use uh, a, a local LLM. So we're using the Llama CPP library. Um, this is an amazing uh, piece of kit. Uh, it means that you can run uh, Llama models uh, and a whole uh, suite of, of related models uh, on a MacBook. So this is uh, specific to MacBook, the CPP library, uh, at about six tokens per second generation which without it, it runs on the CPU uh, super slowly at about one token per six minutes. So it's really, really slow to pretty fast and usable, uh, which is nice. This is why we can now run LLMs on things like uh, mobile phones and watches, uh, because people have done all this amazing uh, adapters and quantization and stuff. So I'm loading in a model I've downloaded, one earlier. This is the Llama 2 7 billion chat model. Uh, if you want to know how to install all of this, the instructions are in the repo on GitHub. Uh, so that's loaded in, ready to go, and now, I'm going to say, right, let's start interacting with this. Now, this is not Langchain. This is the Llama CPP direct API, another example of how all of these things are kind of different. So let's see what it can do. I've asked it to name five government departments. We can look at the output. That's kind of nasty to pass. Again, every single library has its own different ways of doing things, hence why Langchain is kind of nice to use. But if you look through it carefully and know where to look, then um, 
it kind of gets confused. It's talking about health, defense. Uh, it's quite casual today. That's interesting. And then we can, we can ask it something like, okay, uh, tell me something I, I don't know. What's, what's a very um, unknown government department? And it's going to have a think about this. And you can imagine how quickly it's generating behind the scenes. Uh, the leader of the opposition office. Yeah, yeah, not bad, not bad. It didn't make it up entirely. Um, is it a government department? I'm just not sure. So now let's bring all of this together, but using Langchain to run that Llama CPP model. So we've got a load of imports here. Quite a lot of boilerplate and setup. I'm expecting in the next Langchain uh, update, they'll probably get rid of all of that and make it even simpler, but also it'll break everyone's code. But that's the direction in which things are moving. Uh, we're going to define a string callback. This is just a nice, you don't have to have this, but it means that it does the whole thing where it prints out word by word. Uh, it streams the response. We need to configure. This is, at this point, the Llama CPP, it's the Langchain loader. So we're loading in Llama now with the Langchain loader. We're specifying a context window of uh, that thousand-ish tokens. Uh, so not that big, but this is just the max bit. Uh, we've got the model path, we've got how many GPU layers, and, uh, the batch size, and so on and so on. And also, this bit. Remember I talked about putting in your stops, right? If you hit human or input, like, stop talking, like, that's my bit. So don't talk anymore. So that's all loaded in, ready to go. The rest of this code is the identical code because it's Langchain. This is what Langchain is meant to do, is uh, completely consistent code no matter which LLM you're working with. So uh, it's a slightly different template, but otherwise this bit is the same. LLM chain, here's a prompt, here's an LLM. It's a different LLM to the one that you saw before. And I'm asking it, what is a Vicuna? Uh, we'll see if uh, Llama 2 knows what Vicunas are if it's really competitive. But no, it's, uh, it, it kind of knows what they are. Um, long hair resembles a lion, very good. So let's now try conversations with the Llama 2 LLM. And this is now loading in that extra bit we saw earlier, the conversation buffer window memory. Remember the last five things we talked about, but I've given it a system prompt, which is about thinking through things very methodically, go step by step, don't just guess, and uh, we'll see how it works on this. And you can see the streaming node. It's very cool, inside a Jupyter notebook. So it's trying to figure out which NFL team won the Super Bowl in the year Justin Bieber was born. And so it's going step by step. When was he born? Okay, what do I know about the Super Bowl? This is not too bad for a four gigabyte model that seems to know everything about human history and, and more uh, sitting on as a big old file on my, on my desktop. So finally, what's the comparison like to our mind reading example? So hopefully, again, this is a lot of Python code, but it's being, this is stuff you've seen before. We've got a template. It's the same template as before. The prompt is the same, it's identical code is what we saw before. We've got the GPT chain, in fact, identical code here as well to what we saw before. It's just a different LLM thing being fed into it. And we can now play the game. And so it's, I'm thinking of an animal. It's being quite dramatic <laughs> at this time. Um, so it's saying, is it a creature of land or the sea? I'm saying, no, it's an animal. Uh, I am thinking of, I think, uh, parrots again, because that is the Langchain spirit animal, is the parrot, uh, if that's their logo. And so we'll see how it goes. Uh, right, it, it's really dramatic, wow. Okay, so I'm saying, yeah, it's a bird. Um, it's, it's asking, is it a roadrunner? Uh, I think I, I've, I've said yes here, and uh, it's, it's gonna run with it a little bit. And I'm just gonna skip ahead and uh, get it to summarize the conversation using emoji alone, because it can do that, even though it's a local running Llama 2, it's still pretty good at this kind of fun thing. So, we've seen OpenAI, we've seen Langchain. I'm gonna switch modes for a bit and talk a little bit about this cool thing called Streamlit, because uh, for, the, for the technical people amongst you, uh, I think you'll enjoy this. Uh, hands up, who's used Streamlit before? Okay, so some of you, but not all of you. Let's play around with Streamlit. So, Streamlit 101. Streamlit is a library for making interactive interfaces uh, with a very small amount of Python code. Uh, so if you would like to start making a little like dashboardy things, Streamlit might be interesting to you. But if you want to make chatbots, Streamlit's kind of interesting. And if you just want a really simple interface where someone can drag in a file, you run that through like a bit of pandas to clean up the file and spit it back out again so that you could deploy that to the rest of your environment uh, for, your, for your organization. If your organization uses Snowflake, Snowflake bought Streamlit for something like $300 million a couple years ago. And you can now run Streamlit and deploy it inside Snowflake with the whole security boundary that comes with Snowflake. Which means Streamlit, if you're in an organization that uses Snowflake, is a really good tool for sharing little bits of Python code with the rest of everyone else inside your organization with good authentication and uh, protections around it. <coughs> Literally, like click a deploy button and off you go. So the easiest thing to do in terms of Streamlit, let's try it out. Streamlit, hello. This is gonna be the demo, but it'll give you an idea of what Streamlit can do. 
So uh, here we go, it's saying select a demo, let's choose an animation demo. So it can do stuff like this, like have sliders and inputs and it can, uh, it can generate stuff, uh, whatever that stuff may be. So plotting, it can do plotting. It's all um, interactive, so you can play around with that. Uh, mapping, it can do mapping. It's got the code there, but let's get rid of the code. See the map. So again, standard uh, Python UI features, but in a really nice, uh, easy to code up interface. Okay, I'm gonna hit cancel on that, and let's do some more streamlit. So when I say easy to use, it is really easy to use. If you wanna print something out, like this is your most easy streamlit. Uh, streamlit.write. So we're just gonna, we, we're gonna run this one now. Let's uh, make that a bit bigger so it's really, really nice and uh, large for everyone watching. Sorry, I'm doing one-handed coding here, so it's a bit tricky. Okay, so let's make sure I've got commenting out this bit at the bottom, because we don't want that yet. That's, that's in about two minutes' time. So Streamlit, right, I've thrown it just a data frame, and it's nicely formatted that data frame for me. What else can we do? We can do, um, you, you actually don't even need to use dot right. You can actually just write stuff, which feels really uncomfortable for me. I like to at least print it, but no, literally you just put something in and it will do the same thing. Uh, we can also have charts. So if I just grab a little data frame, streamlit.line chart, let's save that, rerun, and boom, we've got a line chart, like fully interactive. Like how easy was that? We were talking, what, not even 10 lines of code uh, if we, you know, we look at the imports and so on, but uh, really, really very easy to build this kind of thing. Uh, let's throw in a map. So uh, we're in an old street at the moment. So I'm gonna randomly generate a load of coordinates around old street and just do literally st.map, throw in the data. And hey presto, we've got a map. So imagine the sort of things you might be able to do with this inside your organization uh, in terms of being able to build very quick and easy uh, data applications. You can connect those to machine learning models. So if you're looking to operationalize a machine learning model that you have built that other people in your organization could benefit from, it's probably the easiest way to do it. Uh, so we can do widgets. Uh, this widget is gonna be a slider. Uh, we're gonna call it X to the user, and we're gonna store the output of that as X, the variable, and then we're gonna set, write a little thing saying X is this. Uh, we're also gonna show you a select T box, and it's gonna tell us what we selected. And there you go, now you've got input elements. So uh, for people who like Python, and for people who don't like HTML and CSS and JavaScript, this basically gives you a React app in like five lines of code. So let's just see some of the other things we can do. I could add a sidebar. Uh, I can add, uh, keeping track of things, uh, what we call session state. We're gonna be needing that in a moment uh, as we build our chat bot. Um, and we'll, we'll just do that and then we'll demonstrate the chat feature. So sidebar, we can now do things. Uh, we can keep track of what we call session state. If I type my name, hit enter, then that will have printed out somewhere. There we go, there we go. Now if I reload the page, it's gonna lose all of that. So session state just means keeping track of it, sort of like a variable, um, because the thing is, in Streamlit, the moment you change something, the whole app reloads itself. So unless you use session state, think of it like a global variable. It's just somewhere where you can like, you like stick on a post-it note on a wall, like, okay, I'm gonna remember this for later. That's what we use session state for, but it's really important, because if you don't use that, then Streamlit immediately forgets something the moment the user types something in. Just imagine using, uh, using ChatGPT, for example, you type something in, and then it just immediately forgets it. That would be kind of frustrating. So we need the session state uh, element of Streamlit to remember these things. Um, and for those of you who, again, like are Pythonistas, but new to Streamlit, the way that I think the mental model you should have when you're interacting with Streamlit is it's, just con it's constantly um, reloading your entire script. So again, use session state to remember things as global variables, but also just remember that it's just running through the script uh, over and over and over again. Uh, so every time you change something or every time the user does something or interacts with it, it just runs, runs anything that you've got printed out. It can be a little bit confusing if you're not used to that. So the other thing they do is compare the code. It is dot chat message, and then are you an AI or are you a human, and then what do you want to write? It is that easy, that is the fundamentals. Like in, we're not, you know, one line of code, like 30 characters of code, we've got this full UI, it's all you need basically to build a chatbot. So, you've seen LangChain, you've seen Llama, you've seen some OpenAI, but I'm not gonna focus on OpenAI again, I want you to remember LangChain so that we're gonna start thinking about the demo that I'm about to walk you through, because it is a lot of Python code, but it works. You've seen all of the components, you've got the building blocks with Streamlit as well. So let's, let's see what that is gonna look like. 
Uh, so if you're, if you're looking at the GitHub repo, this is the app Langchain demo. We'll run it in a moment, but let me just sort of guide you around. There's a lot in here, but it's now things that you have seen. So we start with a load of imports. Yeah, they're not very interesting. Then we've got our caching. We're gonna use the caching this time. Uh, then we've got our Llama CPP. You've seen this bit before, like I want my 1024 context window. Uh, I've got my model path, my Llama 2 7 billion parameter model. Uh, we've got our, our thing that says you stream the outputs to me and uh, stop on the following things as well. You've seen this before. Then we've got this, you've seen this before. It's just the, the, the in fact, I'm not caching this for now, um, the generated response. Uh, so it's just gonna prompt Langchain. It's just a little wrapper that makes it really easy, but what it's doing along the way is it's maintaining the chain in the streamlit session states, that global variable. Otherwise, it will immediately forget that entire conversation. So you do want streamlit to remember the conversation so that every time we run this with a single input, it kind of knows all of that chain. So here is the chain, bring it out of session state, run one of these dot predicts, what you saw earlier, and then update the chain in the global variable, like add the extra line of, um, of information to that post-it note on the wall. Okay, then we've got our initialization. So if there's no chain in session state, if we don't have that post-it on the wall, then kick it off, like start doing the app. Uh, there's a template, we're gonna do the mind reader example. Uh, we've got the history that's gonna get prompted in later. Uh, we've got the prompt. It's all set up, stuff that you saw about five, 10 minutes ago. We've got the LLM chain, again, stuff you've seen before. And uh, we've then got, okay, right, now everything's ready to go. Let's load that into session state so it's got the history. The history, when you first initialize, only being that system prompt. Then we've got a, uh, a little bit of streamlity stuff. So uh, boilerplate code. Um, if we are just spinning this up for the first time, then make sure that we've got uh, the history of everything that the, the bot has said back to us that's generated because we need to like label it as bot or AI or human uh, and also all the things the human has said. So again, just some new empty post-its on the wall this time. Then some streamlit boxes where it's gonna put things, the responses in the chat, that's kind of useful to have ready to go. And we can now kick things off. We're gonna say, right, I want you to throw an input to the user, it's gonna say, say something. Then uh, we're gonna say something, we're gonna generate a response, we're gonna take whatever the human said and write that in the human post-it note and whatever the AI said back and we're gonna write that on the AI post-it note. Here is the initial message, let's go. It's gonna look like this. So very similar to, um, to the stream thing you've seen before, design-wise, uh, but it's kicking off with that initialization prompt. And it's saying, I'm my reader, I'm gonna ask, give me a cafe. I'm gonna say famous person, let's see how it works. So this is now doing a live call out to Langchain locally running on this uh, device. It's saying, is it Elon Musk? Why are you asking me? No, it's not. It's, um, uh, it's a jazz violinist. Interestingly, it's, it's asking me if I can test it. No, 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 you've got to do that. Um, is it stepping up? Okay, so I was thinking it might take a little bit more time. I'm not caching it for this exact reason. I don't want it to cheat. It has nailed my, my, um, my jazz violinist um, in one guess. Um, so yes, uh, tell me about him. Llama 2 is ruining my demo by being too good. Okay, so actually now it's, uh, it's, it's not sure. Uh, okay, it's well Llama 2, like, you're letting yourself down now. Okay, sure. So what does it know? Is it just making this thing up or does it actually have some information somehow encoded into its, uh, its neurons? And it does. Um, this may be entirely hallucinated. You probably want some kind of rag to, to actually uh, double check this, but uh, yeah, that's kind of cool. So I'm gonna wrap up now by just telling you a little bit about rag, this idea, because if you want to be able to have a little bit more confidence in your LLMs, then rag is uh, one very good way to go. Just to backtrack a little bit, um, this is what we've been doing. We've been creating this catalog of messages, responses, uh, keeping track of that in the LLM baseline. We needed to have that whole conversation history thing, otherwise it's just completely distinct and not connected together. So we've built the conversation by stitching the prompts and responses paired together manually as developers, because you kind of have to do all of this manually as a developer. 
Um, so the multi-tenant conversations then turn into a full context, and every time you add something new into it, the context gets updated, and the whole lot gets fed back in to the LLM. The LLM doesn't remember, you have to do it for it. Uh, why am I using Llama 2? Because it's number three on the LLM leaderboard, and it's open source and four gigabytes. Um, so, vector source. Let's talk a little bit about vector source, our last topic of today. The idea being that you can load all sorts of cool and interesting stuff inside your organization or whatever else you want to load into this thing called a vector store, whether that's documents, whether that's PDFs or PowerPoints or videos or uh, this live stream, uh, anything that can be encoded into effectively text uh, at some point can then be loaded into the vector store. Um, or you could even use embeddings that work directly on images as well. Like that's, that's a thing that can, that can happen too. So we embed stuff into long, long vectors, just a load of numbers. And then when we query the vector store, what we're effectively doing is we're throwing it at like a little question. Uh, so if we'd loaded it up with loads of animals and then I, I query it with the question, you know, show me some puppies, uh, then it should know semantically that puppies are similar to all the dog breeds that I've, I've loaded into my vector store. And it will be able to retrieve using a nearest neighbor similarity search or other similarity search algorithm, it'll be able to retrieve some, some records for you, uh, the top N records. So that's the rough idea of vector source. Embed, search, nearest neighbor algorithm. Now, how we use them with LLMs, this is what everyone talks about when they say RAG, retrieval augmented generation, is we ask the LLM some query. Uh, the LLM can decide, or we can force it to, uh, query our vector store, grab some useful relevant embeddings. These may be entire documents, but usually they're maybe a paragraph. Each one might be just a single paragraph from a PDF. And the thing that I'm gonna be sort of pointing towards here is Chroma. There's lots of other things like uh, uh, FAISS, FICE, uh, which is uh, Facebook's um, vector model. But they all do the same kind of thing, which is it makes it easy for you to take a long string of text, whether that's a transcript of a live stream or whether it's a PDF or something else, and chunk it up. So they've got their own auto chunkers. Uh, you can say, give me chunks every 100 characters, or you can say, give me chunks that are every paragraph, or, or be really smart about it. So it just does all of that stuff for you. Um, and then it returns those documents for you. And when I say document, that might be a paragraph, it might be a whole book. When it returns a document, we then just slide that into the LLM context window. Remember, we're managing its memory for it, so we can put anything we like into that. We could fill it with disinformation and then make a really unreliable LLM. Uh, there's nothing stopping us doing that. So that's the idea behind RAG. We, we throw it a load of extra relevant bits of information which it can then use to generate a much smarter answer. So message goes in. Uh, external knowledge gets embedded along with the message behind the scenes. The user doesn't see that, but the LLM does. And uh, we can start doing some cool stuff with RAG. So uh, with RAG, for example, we can uh, have it know things. You could uh, RAG in, I don't know, like the latest meetups happening tonight, for example. And then you could build yourself a meetup similarity or vibe search engine. Uh, you could um, solve the recency problem, again, similar to what I've just mentioned there. Uh, you can also uh, retrieve across an entire knowledge base, your entire basically company SharePoint could go into a RAG vector, uh, vector database. Um, it could be web searches. You could actually have your model uh, using Langchain. The whole idea of Langchain is you can have a model that can choose to take actions. Now, Langchain did it first before, GP, uh, before OpenAI did it. Uh, they, 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 the idea of tool usage where an LLM can decide to search the web or it can decide to run a SQL query against a database or it can decide to do some RAG and then the inputs go back into the LLM and they can decide to do more. So it could do some, some web searches, then do a, a smarter SQL query and then come back to you with a really smart answer on whatever you've just asked it. So lots of data sources could be feeding into that. You could also have citations. That's another really good um, application of RAG. People don't trust LLMs in organizations, in enterprise, and certainly in government because they make stuff up. But citations really, really help with that. If you can just say, here is the exact part of the tax code uh, that backs up my answer. I'm not lying entirely, uh, and you can double check it for yourself. Or here's the citation of the article where I found uh, this information on the web. So with that in mind, uh, I'm gonna wrap up now. I'm not gonna go through the code of this, but it's all open source, it's all on GitHub. Um, but I am gonna show you one cool thing that we can now do with RAG. Here's one I made earlier. In fact, um, at a really cool event, for those of you who are feeling inspired by this, uh, an event called Prompt Jam. Um, it's run at a place called Newspeak House uh, every month or two. And uh, basically, if you want to just learn to do this, uh, this is what I whipped up on Friday last week. So uh, this is, uh, it's gonna help me figure out what to go and watch at PyCon Berlin. I'm gonna be speaking at PyCon Berlin, um, not on this, but on um, sort of uh, related topics. 
But I, there's so much stuff going on. Like, I don't know what to go and watch of all the other talks in there. There's a lot. So it's a cool conference, but um, there's a lot going on. So um, let's do this live. Uh, I love a live demo. Um, what are your main interests or goals for attending the conference? Someone shout out, give me something to tell you. Be bold. Say again? I heard AI. I'm just going to go with AI. Okay. Um, the way that I've designed it is actually kind of curious. I'm going to get it to, it, it knows something about PyCon Berlin. Like, it's actually gone and basically scraped the website, and that's uh, driving the questions, and then I've asked it to ask me three questions so it knows about my interests before it starts building the, the rag-based recommender. So it's actually taken that response, plus all the other context of what's in PyCon Berlin, and uh, it's now going to dig into that. So um, someone, uh, what other aspects of AI are we most interested in? Uh, there's so many questions. Um, who, who went first? Or just shout again. Someone Gen, AI. Gen AI. Okay, that's that's very very relevant. Okay. <laughs> and final question: Are you seeking introductory sessions, uh, applications, commercial? You know what? Because of where we are, I'm just going to say enterprise applications. Hell yeah. And now it's. Basically, going through its, uh, the, the, the full session list, uh, it, it basically has access to all of this in Chroma, running behind the scenes. Uh, it is querying Chroma with, uh, with its work. In fact, it's actually generated a query. We'll see that in a moment. Uh, then it's doing the similarity search on Chroma. It's going to have brought back an ordered series of the most relevant talks uh, which have been embedded into Chroma. And it's going to come back and hopefully recommend us some really interesting talks on uh, enterprise applications of generative AI. So it's taking a little while because it's probably just writing quite a lot behind the scenes when I don't have streaming mode enabled. All right, what did it say? So here is the query. It's basically summarized what it thinks we care about. Uh, your interest might encompass several aspects of Gen AI, introductory sessions, commercial potential, ethical considerations. It's come up with some keywords, Python DE, artificial intelligence, commercial potential, and so on. And then the talks it's recommended to me are the keynote, 10 key questions that a company should ask for responsible AI, uh, something about no more robots. Uh, so there's uh, some Gen AI stable diffusion being referenced here, so that seems kind of relevant. Uh, would you rely on ChatGPT to dial 911? Uh, so another, again, like uh, commercial enterprise. Okay, this genuinely not planned, but, and my talk, uh, which is all about building an open source tool to live transcribe and summarize uh, conversations. So you know what, I'm just gonna leave things there. Thank you very much for watching today, and I'll be in the pub. Time for questions. Oh, we do just talk, sorry. Yeah, all right. Questions. Anybody have questions? So when you think of the hangout questions, I think that one was Which version of Java were you using? Um, so that was Llama 2 uh, specifically. In fact, you know, I'm just going to go to the, bar, the bit of this um, repo which talks about how to set it all up. Uh, so if you go here, it tells you how to install all the things, and I think I'm using the 7 billion chat, uh, which is 7 gigabytes of um, RAM required to run this 4 gigabyte file size. So uh, Llama 2, 7 billion. Okay. Uh, it's, yeah, that's quantized. And it's quantized as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm using, um, I think this is the bloke uh, who I've been reliably informed um, is, is, is a chap somewhere in the middle of the, the UK. Um, but yeah, it's the bloke model. question you know what I'm actually going to demonstrate that using um, something that I re I adapted this this whole thing um, last year I was on a plane <laughs> to ooh, uh, am I in the right place no let's come to this I was on a plane to Beijing and I was sitting next to some some Chinese people uh, and my Mandarin skills were just not good enough for me to ask them what I wanted to ask them which is effectively um, I knew that the, the, the person next to me was, was, was uh, split up from his wife. And I just wanted to say, would you like me to swap with your wife so you can come and sit next to me? So this is basically what I did. I'm sitting down on a plane. I've got all this stuff loaded in. I'm like, you know what? I don't know. but like, And I don't have access to like an offline dictionary or anything like that. But I've got Llama 2. Let's, can Llama 2 do it? So apologies if it's about to make up Mandarin. But let's see how it goes. Nope. 
And the reason I can do this is because it all fully runs offline, uh, which means it's secure and it's private if you're running it uh, on a server, but within your, your digital estate, your security estate, uh, boundaries within your organization. So a very good tool for that. There are also other enterprise tools that are available for doing that kind of thing. Um, but this is a good option, especially for uh, some of the people we work with. They are government data scientists. They can install stuff on their laptop, but they can't access half the internet. Um, so again, I, I, I don't know if that is uh, correct, but um, it's, it's, it's given me something. It's okay. which models allow for offline access. Uh, so let's load up the LLM leaderboard. Uh, I believe this, one of the leaderboards, this may be a different leaderboard to the one I had earlier. Streamlit app as well, this is a nice deployed Streamlit app. If you want to deploy a Streamlit app, you literally click deploy and it'll deploy into the global public Streamlit apps if you want to, or you can do it internally. Um, I, the ones that say open, those are the open ones. So um, Bloom, uh, Cerebrus, ChatGLM, they seem to be uh, ranking high on this, I think this is an order, I would hope so, it's a leaderboard. Um, but you've got your, your code gens as well down here by Salesforce. So lots of things to, uh, to enjoy and play around with. Any other questions? Thank you very much.